All right. Welcome, everybody, to this week's Good Egg Live. My name is Susan Elliott. I'm the Director of Investor Education here at Good Egg Investments. I am joined by the Head of Investor Relations and Business Development, does so much, Jason Kleiman here from Chicago. And uh, I'm in the Pacific Northwest. We are a remote company that loves to help other people invest in real estate passively, just like us. Um, so today we're talking about exploring our multifamily fund returns and, and really just like how do funds work at some fundamental levels? We get these questions a lot from all different levels of investors from beginning to middle to later stage investing. Um, so we're going to take a look at a few ways that returns are calculated, a few ways how it works to when we add different assets to our funds, whether that's multifamily or hotel funds, quite honestly, a lot of principles overlap in those two different models. So um, Jason, should we get started? Sure. Well, welcome, everybody. Thanks, Susan. So I'm Jason Kleiman. I lead our investor relations and business development. Uh, one little note, uh, we do have somebody starting today who's actually going to be taking over the charge on investor relations. So along with me, uh, everybody's going to get to know Ariel. Uh, you're going to get to know her over the next few weeks and months, but uh, we're pretty excited about the, the next step that we're taking in this side. So There'll be more on that. So let's talk today about funds. Uh, we've gotten a lot of questions about how our funds are, are gathered, why we do them in the first place, what the, the pluses and minuses are about these funds. Um, we get a lot of questions that are very simply like, why don't you just invest in one asset at a time like you used to? Why have you gone to this, this path of saying, well, we our structure is really based on funds and we like to spread risk and the whole thing. Why are we doing that? So today's idea is really just talking about the funds from a high level. We're not going to do a deep dive into metrics and how all the IRRs work and this and return. We're not going to do all that today. We're going to keep this very simple. We're going to keep it light. There's an analogy in here and a metaphor that uh, Susan's going to walk us through that's really a lot of fun. So uh, we're going to try to keep it kind of high level. Uh, we love questions, but like Susan said, um, there's a Q&A section in this webinar. That's really the best place. So we're, we're trying to check the chat, but really it's just the two of us today. So if you've got some real questions, please put it in the Q&A. We'll try to do it in real time, maybe at the end, but we promise to get to it. So let's dive in. Let's talk about funds. Um, if we go to the, the next slide. Uh, oh, sorry. I always forget that we've got to do this. Um, so today is for educational purposes only. So please do not take what we say as gospel. Uh, please talk to your own advisor. Please talk to your CPAs, talk to your counsel, anybody who you look to for true advice, please go to them when you're making long-term decisions. This is for educational purposes. Uh, we're giving you opinions based on uh, what we've learned and what we've gleaned, but again, all educational. Great. So we said that. Uh, let's get into the meat of it. Uh, the super simple. What in the world is a fund? There's a lot of different uh, definitions of what a fund or a portfolio can be. But basically, at the core of it, a fund is simply an organization of assets that help us reach a certain goal. So in our world, a goal is to get a decent amount of return, both in cash flow and long-term appreciation for all of our investors. It's a very simple, simple equation. We, we know the goal that our investors tell us time and time again of what they want to achieve. We know the kinds of assets they want to be in based on uh, past experience and where the markets are going. We structure the fund in the portfolio to then hit those levels. So that's the core of it. It's multiple assets. It's meant to be not just one at a time. Now we're actually spreading that risk. So there was a time in the world in the evolution of, of good egg investments where we did single asset acquisitions. Many of you that are probably on this call are part of our single asset acquisitions, and there's nothing wrong with that. We would find some great shiny new piece of uh, real estate somewhere and we would say, you know what, we want to invest in that. Let's go raise some money for that one and then let's put this deal together and then we're all partners in that deal. Nothing wrong with that. What we found over time is that there's some pitfalls in the one asset at a time approach. If you buy, uh, if you put all of your money into one asset, if it does really well, yay, hooray, everybody's happy, everybody takes their money, their winnings, they go off on their merry way, we do the next one, and we keep doing it over and over again. On the other hand, if you put all of your money in one asset and something goes wrong, maybe it's in the market, maybe it's uh, something in the management side, who knows what could happen, maybe there's a hurricane that comes in, anything like that. If all of your money is in that one asset, well, you're exposed. So because of that, we, we've decided to take a different path. And really, this started at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. We made a corporate decision to head into the world of funds. 
So we've made a, a, a really definitive decision to only do investments in a fund structure. There's a small caveat to that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. We do have a way that you can invest singly in one asset at a time. But for the most part, uh, our structure is really uh, focused on funds. Why? Uh, because we get to mix growth and cash flow. So you, everybody on this call has probably heard me talk about this at nauseum. Uh, there's two different kinds of investments, whether you're, you're dealing with hotels, ho uh, multifamily, self-storage, anything like that. You're either looking for growth or you're looking for cash flow. Cash flow is what we what we love in the short term. So when we get those checks in the mail, you know, you get the um, you, you get an ACH notice and says, oh, you know, I got fifteen hundred dollars in my bank account. Yeah, that's short term cash flow. Growth, on the other hand, is you've been holding on to an investment for the past three, four, five years, and all of a sudden you get a check for one hundred thousand dollars. Whoa, that's a lot of fun. The ultimate mix is if you can do both. If we can get some kind of cash flow, some kind of consistency, and still get that growth and appreciation at the back end. That's the magical mixture. And that's what we can get out of a, a fund structure. So number three, it's all about that diversification and risk mitigation. What did I talk about right at the beginning? If you've got all of your money in one project, you're really not mitigating any risk. You're saying, I really hope that this one project does really well. And if it does, I'm going to be thrilled. But if it doesn't, I'm going to have heartburn. So we, we mitigate a lot of that risk by simply spreading your dollars over multiple assets. And you're diversified. So part of what we, we do when we structure these portfolios is we say um, we want things to be correlated, but we don't want things to be perfectly correlated because correlation basically says that if uh, like if you put three, four or five assets in the same portfolio, if one event happens out in the world and they all go up, that's great. But if that one event out in the world actually sends everything down, well, they all go down together. So the whole idea here is we want to diversify in asset type, location, business plan, and mixed in correlation. So we want some things to go up, we want some things to go down, depending on what kind of macroeconomics happen out in the world. So it's a it's a complex weave. It doesn't happen overnight. We don't just you know put our finger up in the air and say, gosh, I hope that these assets look good together. There's some real thought that goes behind these to say, how are these assets going to work together in order to create some kind of consistency and long-term growth while still achieving cash flow in the short term? So we work really hard at that. The fourth bucket here, it, it's exactly what I was just saying, consistent financial performance. That can come in many forms. It can come in cash flow. It can come in long-term growth. It can come in depreciation that you're getting across multiple assets. It can come in uh, all shapes and sizes. But the whole idea here is a fund alleviates a lot of the stress that we as investors go through. If you're just investing in one project at a time, all of your hopes and dreams are based on the activity for that one project. We're trying to get away from that. So that's the idea behind the fund. Okay, so let's go to the next one. Please. A couple misconceptions. So I, I want to keep this positive. I don't want to say, hey, people call me all the time with the wrong idea about what a fund is. Uh, but I do get some interesting questions from time to time. Um, so the first one that uh, I, I get a, a smile on my face about because it, it's I, I love the approach on this whole thing. Uh, folks often call and say, well, if you're going to if you're going to add more assets into the fund, like right now, we've got a, a multifamily fund where we've closed on one asset. We're about to open, uh, uh, close on a second asset. The, the question is, if we add more assets, does that mean that the cash flow is even bigger? Uh, it's a bit of a misconception. What it really means is, and there's an analogy and a metaphor that we're going to go through here in a minute that uh, Susan's going to put a real button on this and make it real clear. Uh, but as we add, more, yeah, as we add more assets, what it really does is it diversifies your funds across those assets that we add. So when we add a second property, well, you're not putting any more money in unless you choose to. Your money is just being spread across those assets. So it doesn't really change your cash flow per se. What it does is it brings the cash flow in from different assets. So if you put in $100,000, now instead of your, your, your cash flow coming from that one property, that $100,000 is creating cash flow from the first, it's creating a portion of the cash flow from the second, and creating a portion of the cash flow from the third. So in theory, as we add more assets and add more investors into the fund, your cash flow really doesn't change. It's the same as what it was day one, as long as the, all the assets are doing what they're supposed to do. What happens though is, you're mitigating that risk. You're spreading your risk and your capital over multiple properties. 
and therefore getting rid of some of that exposure, that bad exposure that we're all trying to run from. So no, uh, if we add more properties, it doesn't mean that your cash flow goes up. Now, if they all do well, absolutely your cash flow is going to go up. But the, that's it, it, just the mere fact that we're adding more properties doesn't necessarily take the cash flow up. The second question that I get is, do additional assets actually create dilution for the investors? No. Uh, if if in a fund, if uh, if you only had one asset and you kept on adding more investors to that fund and you didn't put more assets into it, then yes, you would be diluted. But in a, in a proper fund, if you're adding more investments and more investors and you're also adding more assets to spread those, those dollars across, then absolutely not. You don't get diluted. So you do have to be careful of this. When you're investing with a group that's doing funds, portfolios, you do have to understand what's in that portfolio. Are you investing in a blind fund where assets are going to be added down the road? Or are you investing in a fund that already has the assets in place where they're just putting more dollars into this in order to do some kind of CapEx work or maybe add something to the, the capital stack? You, you have to really understand what kind of fund you're investing in. But the mere fact that we're adding more assets into a fund does not equate to investor dilution. Again, it goes back to if we're if we've got a fund and we're adding more assets, so more dollars at stake, and we're adding more investors, putting more equity in, all that money just gets spread over a much larger platform. So no, there's zero dilution. It's just spreading that risk. It's diversifying across multiple assets. So hopefully that was fairly clear. Um, a fund, if not done correctly, can be dilutive. Ours, we work really hard to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, so, okay, let's go on to the next one before I beat that one up too much. The exposure to it is, is even bigger if you're in a fund. So let's think about this one. Yes, you're, you're going to be looking at a fund with multiple assets, with multiple loans. So from that perspective, there is more debt. There's also a lot more asset value. There's also a lot more equity in that entire fund. So as a percentage, the debt doesn't change. If you were just investing in one asset and it had a 75% LTV, loan LTV, uh, well, your exposure is 75%, whatever the, whatever 75% is of that total value. If in the portfolio, all three assets or all four assets all have an LTV of 75%, your exposure based on your percentage share of the entire portfolio didn't change. So you have no further exposure, you have no further liability. Your exposure is based on your proportionate share of the entire portfolio. So the mere fact that you're adding more assets does nothing with exposure to debt. Uh, now, one thing to keep in mind, the individual assets within a portfolio, especially the way that we put them together, each individual asset holds its own debt. It holds its own entity. It holds its own liabilities. So they're not all cobbled together and commingled. There are these things out in the world. People probably heard these words, commingled funds, uh, all kinds of larger funds like that. We won't get into that, but that's where all the, the financials and all the debt and all, uh, the equity stacks, everything, they're all commingled together. We do not do that. In our funds, each asset is created within its own little silo. So although we, we benefit from being uh, exposed to the cash flow of the entire portfolio, we aren't exposed to the downside for any particular asset that's going to bring the entire fund down. So we do not take any debt at the fund level. All of our debt is at the asset level. So if there is some kind of situation, worst case, some kind of situation that really plummets the value on one property, it doesn't have any bearing on the other two properties or the other three properties. So there's really no exposure um, on a fund perspective just because there's multiple assets. It's very important. Um, if they were commingled and if there was some larger uh, debt structure that took on all the properties, then we'd have a different conversation. That is not how we structure our funds. Okay, then lastly, I have to wait until the total funds exit before seeing any returns. This one, it, it's, it's a real concern. I've gotten this one many, many times over. So here's the thought. Somebody invests $100,000 in a fund of three properties. Let's say it's one of our multifamily properties. They put their $100,000 in. Things go really well. We start selling properties, I don't know, year three and a half, year four, and we don't fully exit the third property until maybe year six. So the question is, does that mean that I have to wait until the entire fund 
is exited before I get to realize my gains until I get to take my winnings and go buy my boat or whatever I'm going to do with it, right? Uh, the, the simple answer is absolutely not. The way that we've structured our funds is that when there's an event, an equity event on a singular piece of uh, piece of property, you get your benefit at that moment. So let's let's talk real world example. There's three properties within a fund. We sell the first property in year number four. Uh, you had invested $100,000 in the beginning. There's a portion of the winnings at that point. Uh, you've got a $75,000 check that you're uh, you're due to get from the sale of that first property. The good news is. In our structure, you get that $75,000 check the second that we close on that first property. And then again, when the second property sells, you get your check at that point. And then again, when the last property sells, you get your check at that point. All the while, you're still creating your cash flow from the properties that are still remaining in the fund. So the way that we've structured this, we're trying to benefit everybody. We're trying to uh, not create extra exposure to debt or or uh, keep any anybody's cash sitting in a vault somewhere where we're taking advantage of it and then you're not realizing all your gains. We want you as an investor to realize all the winnings when they occur. That's how we've structured things. Now, again, I go back to an earlier comment. You have to be aware of the types of funds that you're investing in because not all funds are created equal. Some funds would put you in that exposed position. Some funds would put you in a position where you have to wait until the fund manager exits everything before you get to realize your dollars. It's not how we've structured this and we've worked really hard to, to not put people into that type of position, but it goes back to, you really have to be knowledgeable on the kind of fund that you're investing in. All right, so those are some of the misconceptions. Let's talk about the fund piece. So the returns. Now, uh, this is just a high level example. Please don't anybody look at the numbers on here and think that this is reality for any certain deal. This has nothing to do with any properties that we own right now. This is simply putting numbers on a page so we can all kind of see an example. Okay, so let's look at this in year one of a portfolio. Let's imagine it was a multifamily portfolio. We And let's imagine that we bought three properties. The first property, asset A, uh, let's say the first year that asset A saw a 2% cash flow back to investors. Okay, I mean, it's not out of bounds. That's so we see that often. But asset B did really well in the first year. It got 6%. And then asset C got 4%. What does that mean to you as, as the investor? Well, you get your proportionate share of the whole thing. So on average, that means we'd take it all together at the fund level, and then we would pay out for the year on average 4.3%. Not bad for the first year within a portfolio of multifamily assets. That's right in line with what we would hope to get. If you can get anything above 4%, it's a home run in the first year of multifamily. And now, Jason, I have a, a question here quick. So that would be, yeah. correct me if I'm wrong, the assumption here is that those three assets have the same amount of equity that we've raised for them. For instance, like each one of them was a $10 million raise. So they're all equal in that way. In what situation would it be that the, that are that things would be weighted a little bit differently, in which case the calculation would be skewed a little bit depending on yeah. how large each of those amounts of equity is inside those assets. Yeah, excellent point. Thank you. Um, so these, this, the whole assumption here is that each one has the same amount of equity in it. The reality simple is math. When we put, simple yeah, math. Yeah, it's it's simple math. It's meant to be it's something that we can put our arms around. But the reality is when we put together multiple multiple properties, it's rare that the equity amount going into each deal is the same. Maybe the, the, the overall asset values are different. We might buy the first asset at 50 million, the next one might be 70 million, and then we find, buy one for 30 million. Well, if, if we're trying to reach somewhere between 70 and 75% LTV on each one, that means the amount of equity going into each deal is vastly different. So you as the investor in that fund, you get your proportionate share based on how much of the overall equity goes into each deal. So it may be that asset A, uh, you've got 40% of your money in. Asset B, you might have 20% in. And then asset C, you might have the balance. So it's, it's rare that it's going to be exact between the three or four or five. Uh, in this case, just for simple math, you're exactly right. We assume that the amount of equity into each deal is the exact same, but it's rare that that happens. So let's look at what happens down the road. Uh, now, uh, we, we said what happens in year four. Uh, that asset B that did really well in the first year, let's assume it does really well in year four and we're getting over 12%, maybe even higher. Uh, but the other assets, they're growing, but not as quickly. So what does that mean? On average, now, instead of 4.3 in that first year, you're getting 9%. 
one of the arguments that I get often, yeah, arguments is a tough word. One of the questions that I get uh, on a regular basis is, well, gee whiz, if I would have just invested in asset B, I would have been better off. Maybe. Uh, the reality is that if you would have invested in just asset B and everything worked out, let's go back to that example I said right at the beginning. If everything worked out, yeah, that's a home run deal. But what if? What if, on the other hand, we had looked at each other in the eye and said, you know what, asset A is where we need to put all of our money. Well, that was the, the lowest return out of the three. And you know we're all very smart people. We spend a lot of time around these assets. We do all kinds of uh, metrics and uh, you know discounted cash flows about what's going to happen here, what's going to happen there, what the market's going to do. The reality is that we don't always know exactly what's going to happen. So we can take the gamble on one asset at a time, but it truly is a gamble. And if it works out, yay. If it doesn't, well, we all look at each other and ask questions like, why did we make this decision? So instead of going on and on with those kinds of back and forth discussions, that's why the, the, the fund really starts to make sense. We put ourselves in that position where no matter what's going to happen within these assets, as long as they're properly correlated, uh, then we can withstand almost any market volatility. So we might not be able to get that top end 12% that you're getting in asset B, but the, the consistent cash flow that we're getting from this entire portfolio, portfolio is great. And remember, we're going to get uh, all the benefits of selling these individually as they go. And the, the hope is that we put these together in a way that we're going to hit you know, these big appreciation numbers where we get that big equity multiple on a per, per asset basis as well. So this is the whole idea and the genesis behind the fund. It's about creating a little bit more stability in this world that is far from stable. So uh, the world of multifamily especially is completely up and down these days. Debt markets are crazy. Rental rates are crazy. Occupancy rates go up and down based on the market. Population growth is still there, but it's very hard to put your arms around any one asset or any one market and say, I just know this is going to do well. I can give you a long list of people in Nashville that made huge bets over the last few years. It was a tough one. Uh, I can give you a very long list of people in Phoenix who made huge bets on singular assets. You know, it's been a, it's been a tough run the last couple of years. It will write itself, but if you were in the middle of a fund, you can withstand just about anything. So that's the idea. Now we're going to make it fun. So let's talk about what happens when, when we add more assets to the fund. Um, it, we, we talked about this at length, and there was a metaphor that Susan came up with, which I thought was really cool. And it's based on one of my favorite things, eating. So based on that, I'm going to turn it over to Susan and let her do the fun part. So when I was thinking about this, like how can we think about what happens when we have, um, for instance, in our recent Good Egg Wealth Fund one, we purchased Encore Metro. This is a fantastic property um, located down in Orlando. And that, um, that uh, acquisition happened last December. And now we're adding Crown Club and we're almost a full quarter or even more so um, beyond. So what happens when we add a new asset to the fund, to the people that are already invested that maybe want to invest more, to the new investors that come in? So I hope that we can answer some of these questions with this. But first, who's hungry? I am just a little bit here on the Pacific time. It's 1020. It's about time for my morning snack, maybe lunchtime. So let's think about uh, ordering pizza together. So this is the Pepperoni Pines apartment pie at our uh, multifamily pizzeria. By here. the way, the, and... the pepperoni, pepperoni Pines is an incredible asset. Everybody should go live there. Yeah, it's great occupancy numbers. Um, <laughs> we've got eight slices total here. So I'm hoping that I can get some friends together. We can share in this pie, this great asset that we have here sitting on our dining table. Um, but what's nice about pie and pizza is that I don't have to do full slices, right? Maybe someone's just wants a quick snack. So I could actually sell eight full slices. I could also sell 16 halves or 32 quarter slices. So I end up offering this up to my group of friends for lunch and I sell this sort of proportion of um, slices of my pizza pie. Now we haven't started really eating yet, but we've got a lot more people lining up at the door because this pizza smells really good. So 
we also think, you know what? We like pepperoni, but there's some other pies on this menu that look really good. And we've got all these people that are also hungry now that we've been talking about pizza. We've been talking about the fresh pepperoni and the mozzarella that's on top. We're thinking about it coming out of the oven. I mean, I'm getting hungry just talking about this analogy right now. I'm going to have to probably eat pizza for lunch today. Um, so we decide to add an additional pizza to our dining table here. This is mozzarella meadows and and um, it's just, it's a really great asset too for our pizzeria pie lunchtime. Um, again, we've got eight slices that we can bring in more people here. We end up bringing in people who want, um, two people who want a full slice, eight people who want a half and eight people who want a quarter at this point. Um, but again, we still have demand. So we have a third asset, Veggie Delight Villas, eight slices available and luckily, We've got eight people to come in and make it really simple. But what's what's cool about Villas is that four, let's just say four of these slices were actually sold to people who already purchased previous pizza slices because they just realized they're so hungry and these pies look so good that they've actually purchased an additional slice. So this isn't necessarily all new people at the table. So this is now what our composition looks like of our three pizza pies, right? We've got enough people here that have purchased pizza slices that we're all able to enjoy it. Our table has gone from looking something like this, just a nice intimate lunch gathering to more like the, um, the, farm to table feast that you have in the backyards of certainly the vineyards here in the Columbia River Gorge where I live. Hopefully you've got some beautiful farm to table vineyard action out there in Chicago, Jason. Um, but now wow, we've well, so. we've essentially expanded our dining table to be able to bring more people to our pizza luncheon. We've purchased more assets for our luncheon, more pizza to be able to bring more people in. The benefit here too is that say you purchased a full slice and you came on board when we were talking about that mozzarella because you're the simple part. You like mozzarella. You like pepperoni, but like mozzarella pizza pies are where it's at. Just the simple basil mozzarella. I get it. It's just a classic, right? But you maybe you like the veggie delight a little bit too, but you came on board here. What's nice about your share of this pizza of this single asset is that it's actually broken down into the three asset types. So even though you came on board when that happened, you actually get to share in the delight of these other two pies as well. And like we said in our examples before about it being broken down evenly, this is assuming that we have eight slices in each pie to um, to divvy up to the people that come and sit at the table. So you're going to get an even proportion of that. Um, now, if we had ordered like a super duper extra large mozzarella pie and then just sort of like 14 inch pies on the other slices, these shares would be slightly different because um, just because of the size of those pizza pies. And I, I particularly gravitate to this analogy because it makes me think of like, what does happen? I've been enjoying... Um, you know, being invested in this first pie, right? Maybe you you joined us to invest in Encore Metro back last year and you, you know, were able to take advantage of the taxes, uh, the tax advantages, the depreciation that happened in year 2023. So you got a little boost then too for joining us early in this fund. Um, but now you're seeing other investors come into the fund and it's it can be really easy for us as humans to think like, wait a minute, are they taking some of my share of this pie? Or am I going to be able to take advantage of Crown Club now that that's, that's being added to the deal? And I like to think about it as, you know, we're, we're making this table bigger for more people to come and sit at us with. We're making, we're ordering more pizzas to be able to accommodate the number of people that that table can accommodate. And in the end, we're all going to be able to share in these pizzas in for however much sort of number of seats we have at the table. I mentioned that some people came in on the Veggie Delight and purchased an additional slice. So they're kind of taking up two seats at that table, in other words. Um, they're they're bringing in more equity to purchase our um, our pizza estates here that mm -hmm. we have here, this varied, uh, varied resource. So mm -hmm. Jason, can you think of anything else that's important to add when we talk about adding different assets to a fund sort of over time? Well, one of the, the big things, if we stick with the the, the metaphor of pizza here, um, as more pizzas are brought out and more more investors come into uh, come to the table and want more pizza, 
you might see another pizza that's brought to the table and you said, yeah, but I made my investment. I, I first said it and I wanted to be part of the pepperoni way back when. That pizza over there uh, looks really good too, but I made my commitment way back then. The good thing about this kind of table analogy is you get a piece of the new pizza just by being there, just by being at the table. You don't have to do a darn thing. Your, your piece is going to be split between all of them. So as you see new things come to the table and you say, gosh, I really like that and I wish I would have been there. Well, the mere fact that you're part of that fund means you're there. It means you get all that pizza. So it's really fun. And then on top of it, if you decide you want more slices, you can. You can add more. You can buy more slices. And guess what? Each one of those slices that you buy from this point on will include all of the different kinds of pizza. So it's a pretty cool thing. You get to get a piece of all the action and you can keep adding to your heart's delight. So I love the, the metaphor. I think it's perfect. Well, tell us a little bit about the types of funds we have available right now um, and how they fit into, For this is a great segue because the growth fund here mm -hmm. is a little bit different, structured very differently than our multi-asset funds. So tell us about how the growth funds maybe fit into the context of the bigger funds too. Mm -hmm. So all of our funds, are, are uh, whether it's multifamily or hotels, our funds are accredited funds, meaning that everybody who invests them has to be an accredited investor. Well, previously, all of our funds right. were accredited funds. Right. So here's the caveat. This is what I mentioned from way back at the beginning. Um, our We've worked really hard to be able to allow all investors into our investments. So what we've done is we've created um, a window of opportunity for any investor, whether they're accredited or not, to invest directly in one of our assets one at a time within our larger funds. So we do have a larger multifamily fund that's for accredited investors, but each individual investment within that, we cre we've created a crowdfunding channel that allows any investor to come in. And it's really a, a window for number, number one, you can invest um, if you're accredited or not, number two, you can make the choice to invest in just that one type of pizza. So this is that that uh, small opportunity to say, well, you know, I really just like the pepperoni. So I want to invest in just the pepperoni. And so we've got a small window of opportunity. That's what uh, our growth funds are. So this one's on the screen. This is growth fund number three. This is our third iteration of this. We're using the crowdfunding regulations through the SEC. And this is the avenue where you can you can choose to invest in just that one property. So we do have a uh, property that we're closing middle of May, gosh, we're May 1st today, uh, middle of May in uh, Winston-Salem, North Carolina. It's 250 units, beautiful property. Um, growth fund number three is that avenue where you can choose to invest in just that one property. And if you're not accredited or soon to be accredited, this is your window to do that. It's a smaller window. We aren't raising huge amounts of funds in, in this particular investment, but um, if if this sounds good to you and this is an avenue you wanna take, uh, you've got about two weeks. So we'd love for you to get involved with that one. You can get to it simply by going to our website. You go to the, uh, the Invest Now button, um, and then you'll see all the open funds and then just follow the path to get to our crowdfunding site. And then you'll be able to put your investment in within minutes. So if we go to the next one, then you'll you'll see this this growth fund is actually part of our. I'm sorry, forgot this was there. <laughs> um, the the crown the crown club metrics. Um, if we look at just that asset by itself, what's really fun about this one? It's a 1995 vintage. We're buying it directly from the developer, the original developer who bought this. Or, sorry, built it in 1995. Has cared for this asset as if it were his very own. Uh, nobody ever leaves. Their retention, their renewals, it's well over 70%. Uh, their, their, uh, uh, the rental rate increase year over year is about 6%. It's very steady. Uh, they're at about 97% occupied, and it's just a beautiful property. All the metrics are fantastic. I really feel like we got lucky finding this one, and we, we were able to do a deal directly with the developer. Kind of on market, kind of off market, but it was really just a person-to-person -person deal. So the good thing about this is that the average cash on cash over a five-year period is going to be nearly 8% for, the, for these investors. Um, if you dig into this, you see in year number three, the cash on cash really is over 10%. The first year, there's a bit of, uh, bit of value add. We're going to be improving about 50% of the units at different levels. Uh, so once we put all the value add in, by the time we get to year three, um, we all get to enjoy about a 10 to 10.5% uh, return. So when we talk about mixing the cash flow with appreciation, this is what we're talking about. And over a five-year swing, we're looking at basically doubling our money. 
So with an equity multiple of nearly 2% or two times, that means you put 10,000 in or 100,000 in, you're going to literally double your money over that period of time. So that's Crown Club, fantastic asset, super excited about that one. The next page uh, talks about our, our multifamily fund. This is the accredited fund I was talking about. Crown, Crown Club Apartments is part of this fund, but this fund also incorporates uh, Encore Metro down in Orlando. So when we talk about the different kinds of pizza, well, this fund has two types of pizza right now. Um, so the first one we, we acquired in December, uh, the second one we're uh, closing on in about two weeks. So if you get involved in this accredited fund, uh, if you put dollars in today, you get to take advantage of the cash flow that this fund is already creating. So we closed on uh, Encore Metro December 5th of 2023. Uh, it's already creating distributions. So uh, the second that you put cash in, you're starting to accrue your preferred return and you actually get part of that cash flow window and you'll be part of the next distribution. So it's a lot of fun that way. And again, this, this is all accessible directly through our website. Up at the top, you can uh, you can go to goodegginvestments.com slash portfolio. That'll show you uh, our track record and our current portfolio. But then you'll also be able to get to our deals section. So it's goodegginvestments.com slash deals. Go there and you'll see all of our open deals. A little bit of background. You've all heard me say this time and time again. I'll do it again. Uh, multifamily assets, we've acquired well over 8,000 units. It's actually closer to 9,000 now. Um, our average hold time was really just three years, but there's a big caveat to that. We haven't sold anything for about two years now. The markets just have not made any sense to actually sell anything. So we've just been holding on to our portfolio. Um, at this point going forward, we just tell everybody, expect that there's going to be a five-year horizon when we buy anything. That's a safer way to, to jump into this. Distributions, it's almost th uh, $35 million that we've paid out since our inception, just 2018. So we're pretty proud of that. Um, we've placed at this point, placed, deployed in real capital from our investors, nearly $200 million of real assets deployed into, in, into properties all over the country. Pretty exciting. Uh, crowdfunding dollars, uh, we've now brought in almost $4 million. Uh, those are folks, mainly non-accredited folks. That's pretty exciting, too. We weren't able to do this uh, a year and a half ago, so that's been a lot of fun. Uh, our average equity multiple for those, those assets that we've actually completely gone full cycle on, it's just over 2.8. Now, remember, we, we've exited, I think, on 21 properties now, but we haven't exited anything for two years. So that number is getting a little bit old, but uh, we're, we're still trying to achieve those same levels. Uh, I think that's it. Yeah. I think that yeah. we've hit the end. Well, it's pretty easy to invest. You're always welcome to jump on a call with us as well. You can reach Jason anytime at Investor Relations um, at goodegginvestments.com. And soon you'll all meet Ariel as well. And she's going to help a lot of our investors answer your questions at any point. Um, my my email is open as well, Susan at goodegginvestments.com as well. You can call or, or text us anytime at the number up on your screen. And um, that will jump you to a voice message, but we will give you a call back within 24 hours. Um, so we're all always happy to answer nitty gritty questions about this. We did have a question come up in the Q&A and I did my best to answer it, but I wasn't um, quite sure about the beginning of it. I think it was more of like, I believe the question referenced that when we continue to raise after an asset has closed. So maybe Jason, you could just give us a little bit, you know, in, in that case, wondering that basically is, are, is there dilution happening um, to the shares and to the distributions at that point? So what happens, for instance, um, a great a great example of this is the two hotels that we purchased inside our mm -hmm. hotel fund from last year that we actually were able to continue to raise equity for those because of this really cool flexible um, feature that we had in that fund. So talk a little bit about that and maybe another way that that could work out. Yeah. Um, a hotel, a ho the growth fund number two, which was the hotel acquisition of two hotels in, in uh, Fort Knox, Kentucky. That one is a very different situation because it, it's, it's all about our partner. So with most of our hotels, we have an operating partner out of Indianapolis, Indiana called General Hotel Corp. General Hotel Corp has been a, a hotel developer for the past 60 years, family run business. Uh, they know the management of, of hotels, especially select service hotels inside and out. They are our partner. They're our go-to for everything in the management uh, of these hotels and making sure that we're creating value long-term. In those two hotels, specifically in Kentucky, um, General Hotel Corp, and specifically the CEO, uh, took a 25% stake in those two hotels. It was purposely done from the beginning that we could make those dollars fungible. He was okay staying in as an equity partner or giving up his equity stake, either way. Now, the benefit to him is 
uh, he he's got the management of these, so uh, he's got a vested interest in staying into these th into these things. So uh, it was part of the structure that we said, yeah, we'd love for you to be an equity partner with us, but we don't necessarily need you. When we opened up growth fund number two, uh, we first did it for just the one point two million, and then we realized there was so much activity on it that we went back to our partner, General Hotel Corp, and said, well, we want to take advantage of these fungible dollars, and you know what? They did exactly what they said they were going to do, and they allowed us to put more money in, and we simply removed them out of the capital stack. So nobody got diluted. Nobody. This was a huge home run for everybody that got involved. It was great. We we raised nearly $3 million from our non-accredited folks in that fund. We only expected 1.2, but there was so much activity. Um, we just kept it going, and then we finally had to stop it at some point. That's a, a fantastic transition too to our second question here, Jason. In that we have these um, these growth funds open, and we have a very specific raise capacity initially on most of these mm -hmm. funds. And that, for instance, the question is: Hotel Growth Fund two raised two million instead of the one point two eight million. Please explain. Mm -hmm. So initially, when we launch a growth fund, we have a very limited amount, and that is SEC regulated amount that we are allowed to. Uh, raise at that point. Now, if we get close to that point and we still have enough runway before we purchase the asset, because SEC requires that that fund has to close as soon as we close on that asset, we can't keep it open like we can with our other funds where we can continue to have that flexibility that Jason just described and bring on more investors and kind mm -hmm. of replace them with other people that were able to move out of the deal, other partners that have agreed upon that. So so if we have enough space and we've met our initial raise capacity, sometimes we can increase our raise capacity. We have to go through a lot of checks and balances, a lot of paperwork with the SEC to be able to say we've met our raise. We would like to increase it to a potential $3 million, let's say. Mm -hmm. total. So you may see on our growth funds that we say we we can only take a certain number of spots, but then we actually were, are able to open up some more. But it's that unique scenario where we have enough time that it makes sense to do that. Now, if we only had a week, for instance, right now, if we hit our raise capacity for the growth fund, which we're, we're close, but there's still some room in it, we would not be able to open up more space because there's just not enough time before the closing of the asset that the paperwork would all come through. We'd be able to launch it. We'd be able to help people get their paperwork in. There's a lot of like lead time with paperwork in this industry. So we're unable to open it up to increase that raise capacity. Um, Jason, would you have anything else to add there? No, that, that's exactly it. Uh, okay. I mean, we're we're kind of hamstrung by the SEC regulations. Um, if, if we could just open it up to any dollars, we would. Uh, but the, the reality is it's actually 1.235 million. It's some crazy number, but that's our uh, that's our initial window. So when we put that out there at 1.2 million, we're not just picking this out of the air. We're putting it out there because that's all we're allowed to do. And then if we go through the next iterations with the SEC, then we can expand that. But you're right, Susan, uh, the, mm -hmm. the hurdles that we have to go through in order to make that happen, they're they're pretty rigorous. And look, it's, mm -hmm. it's all for for good reasons. The SEC is trying to protect the interest of, of individual investors. So we get it. We just play by the rules. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Those checks and balances are in the benefit of the investors, um, but yep. they they provide restrictions for all of us. Any other mm -hmm. questions before we end today? Um, again, feel free to reach out to us too. If you don't want to answer, ask them live here today. But with nothing in our Q&A, we're going to say goodbye and we'll look forward to seeing you. Don't forget to join us weekly at the popovers. It's a really casual chat every Tuesday at 11 a.m. Pacific time. You'll get that reminder in your inbox that morning. We find you can be a fly on the wall if your headphones on at work even or on a commute. Uh, we know it's from the middle of your workday, so you can't all participate. But we, investors bring their real questions to us real time based on what they're seeing, what they're looking at. Um, and it can be pretty fun to get to know other investors as well as members of our team. Julie actually joined us this past week, which was a, mm -hmm. a super fun surprise. So um, please be sure to join that and we'll see you um, at the next one. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.